Let's pray as we come to God's word. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that uh, you have said that uh, you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So we pray as we think this morning about your church and our part in it, that you will do your sovereign work to bring about your great purpose of establishing your church and your kingdom. And we pray it in your name. Amen. The human body is an amazing creation. Uh, In the human body there are around 37 trillion cells that all work together to make up our body and to keep us going. And it's able to do an amazing array of things. Uh, Every step you take, you know, takes about 200 muscles. So that's a whole lot of things that have to work together just to take a step. You know, if your eye uh, was a digital camera, it would be a 576 megapixel digital camera. The best camera that human beings can make so far is about 120 megapixels. So it's got a resolution about 20% of the human eye. And it costs about $45,000. And it's way bigger than your eye. You would not want it hanging off your head. Uh, The human body on a relatively small amount of fuel can do an incredible amount of stuff. Make complicated decisions, risk management, assess risk, design things, make them. When they go wrong, fix them. All sorts of stuff. And physically you can do an amazing array of things. And uh, when male and female work together... Uh, They're able to produce another human being. It's absolutely amazing. All this, of course, needs all those cells and organs and chemicals and all that stuff to work together harmoniously. And when it goes wrong, the body has these amazing systems to let us know that something's gone wrong. It's called pain. And it tells us, "Take take a spell, go to the hospital, go to your doctor, whatever. And then it's got a system that deals with that stuff. We've got cells that fight infection and things that go and, and, and try and stop bleeding and all that kind of stuff. It's very, very complicated, but very, very amazing. Uh, as the Bible says, the Psalms say, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And scientists are still plumbing the depths of what the human body can do and how it works. And of course, they've only gone so far, so far. Amazing uh, job that people have. Uh, trying to understand what, how God's made us. Now, it's this image of the human body that Paul takes and uses when he's trying to explain how the church is meant to work, how us together are meant to work, uh, with every person and every gift taking their place for the common good and for the building up uh, of Christ and his body. So verse 12 says this, If you've got your Bible open there or your device open, it says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one, so it is with Christ. That sentence ends quite unusually, doesn't it? He ends it by saying, so it is with Christ. You would expect him to end it by saying, so it is with the church, wouldn't you? But what Paul is trying to say here is that Christ is all in all in the church. He is the head, he's our saviour, he's the reason why we're here in his church, he's the reason why our sins are forgiven, he's our boss, he's our Lord, he is everything. And Paul's trying to get that across to us. Church is not ours, it's Jesus' church and we're a part of it. Um, The essence of being a Christian is being in a relationship with Jesus, a relationship where we have trusted ourselves to him we're throwing ourselves on his mercy for the forgiveness of our sins and he has brought us into his body through that last week we were looking at a few close-up shots of uh, gifts and the reason for gifts and the purpose uh, and so on this week we're the lens is coming out a bit wide angle and we're paul's looking at how does all this work together all the different gifts and all that how, how's god planned for this to work together so that everything can be 
the way God wanted it to be. Well, in verse, uh, in verse 13, he talks about, uh, he says this, when, when one spirit, we're all baptised into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of the one spirit. So how did we get into this body? How did we come to believe that Jesus is our Lord and that he's our rescuer, our saviour? Well, Paul's saying it's a work of the Holy Spirit. Nobody can come into God's family without the Holy Spirit coming in and making us aware that we are separated from God and that we need what Jesus did on that cross uh, to bring us into relationship with God, to bring us into God's family. And so Paul says it's like being baptised into the Spirit or by the Spirit, in the Spirit. That's how people become Christians. They, God, or Jesus literally, whenever the baptism of the Spirit is talked about in the Gospels, Jesus is the baptizer. Jesus is the one who does it. And he does it through the agency of the Spirit where we are immersed into the Spirit. In other words, the surroundings of our being from then on uh, well, which is talk, it's talk about in the same terms about Jesus as well. We are immersed into Christ and that happens by the power of the Spirit. We are immersed into the Spirit. And he also says that we are caused to drink, we've all drunk the same Spirit. He's not talking about whiskey or whatever. He's talking about the Holy Spirit has come inside of us as well, as well as the, uh, us being immersed into the Spirit. The Spirit has, is inside of us to empower us to be the people that God wants us to be. So that's how we got there, into the body of Christ, if you're a Christian. And Paul says that whoever you are, that's how you got there. He talks about the big divisions that were in their society at the time, Gentile and Jew, slave and free. Those things are a bit meaningless to us, I think, but uh, I guess we could put it this way. Paul might have written this way if he's writing to us. Uh, Whether you're poor or rich whether you're illiterate or you've got a couple of PhDs, whether you were a Q jumper or a migrant or whether you're a celebrity or a nobody or a business owner or a labourer, whether you're employed or unemployed, whether you're a vulnerable person or a powerful person, whatever. We all got here the same way. There's not one of us sitting here this morning that's here uh, because we're rich or because we're smart or because we're powerful. If we're a member of the body of Christ, we only got there by the power of the Holy Spirit applying to us the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. That's how we're here. So Paul's setting up this big picture. That's how we're here. It's the work of God. And then he's talking about, right, we're one body, many members. Now he then speaks about two kinds of responses that people can have to that idea so the first one is in verses 14 to 20 where a person might say I don't have a place I don't fit you know I can't preach I can't lead I can't sing I can't run a life group you know all the stuff I see people doing at church I can't do that so I don't fit but Paul refutes that idea he says the body consists of one member it doesn't consist of one member but many and he makes this comparison that sounds silly, really. He says, imagine it, the, the foot saying, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. This is a ludicrous picture, isn't it? Uh, or the ear might say to the eye, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. That's a silly idea. It's a ridiculous concept. And so he's saying, if, if we're saying, I don't, I don't fit here, I, I, I don't have a contribution to make, uh, then that's, uh, that changes the way the body Uh, doesn't work Um, Paul says the obvious thing if the whole body were an eye or an ear uh, where would the sense of smell be or 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 how would you walk or do pretty much anything it just wouldn't work would it and so Paul is saying to the Corinthians look if you say stuff like that that I don't have I don't have a get a contribution to make the building up of the body uh That doesn't change the fact that you belong to the body if you're a believer. What it changes is that your contribution doesn't get made. That this great task of building up the body of Christ, contributing to the good of God's people, slows down. Or bits of it don't get done. The body limps around if the foot's missing, doesn't it? 
and we try and put a fake one on so that the body can walk. Um, infection rages in the body if the cells that fight infection don't do their job. If one of your eyes is not working, it's very hard to get depth of vision, isn't it? Paul is making these obvious comparisons with the body and he's saying the body of Christ, if everyone doesn't do their bit, it diminishes God's great task of building us up and making us like Jesus. Now some of you know only too well how these things work uh, because bits of your body have gone on strike or they're wearing out and and you you know in, in a greater way than some of us the reality of this. And uh, we know too the reality of this in the church. You know, if I'm feeling really hurt and upset or just depressed and someone with the gift of encouragement doesn't come alongside me and say, hey Sam, I noticed you, you know, you've been a bit sad lately, everything okay? And doesn't come alongside me and encourage me. Or, you know, that diminishes the body of Christ, doesn't it? It means that my contribution gets less, I think. And I've experienced that. And, and, and if, if, if we don't encourage one another or if someone has a big win, you know, and, and, and we don't rejoice with them and say, yeah, good on you, doesn't that spur you on to go to the next level, <laughs> you know, when someone does that for you? This is what Paul's saying. We all have this kind of role to make in the church. Of course, the obvious thing uh, is that, you know, if there's, uh, th- there's no food on the table out there, uh, after church for lunch if, uh, if the people with the gifts of hospitality don't exercise them. That's some, there's some really obvious things like that, aren't they? Um, if we don't do our God-ordained jobs. Now, the issue here is not just that if we don't take our part that we remain uh, unfulfilled. Uh, yeah, that, that might be a problem. I, and, and not even what I've just said... Uh, is, is really a, a really big issue to the one I'm about to mention, that you know the, the building up of the body of Christ gets slowed down. There's an even bigger issue here that Paul talks about in verse 18, that God has arranged or appointed, literally the word means he has appointed, uh, the members. God himself has appointed each one of us to take our role in the body of Christ. And that's a big deal if we don't do that. If we don't say, well, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that God's appointed me to be an encourager or to help out with AV or whatever. It, that, that's, a, that's a big thing if we say, God, thank you very much for appointing me to do that, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, that's a big deal. We miss out on our God-ordained roles. And we don't do the good works that God has prepared beforehand for us to do. The second kind of response to the idea that uh, we're all members of the body of Christ is that someone might say to somebody else, we don't need you. That's in verses 21 to 26. What a tragedy it is when that happens. Uh, When not just the person is discouraged or the body misses out on their contribution, but again, the work of God in appointing people uh, to take that part of building up the body of Christ is frustrated. So what Paul's addressing here is the issue of us thinking that some people and their input into the building up of the body of Christ doesn't matter or we can do without it. He makes the point, as with our physical bodies, the parts that seem to be weaker uh, are indispensable or the less honourable bits are given greater honour. The unpresentable bits are treated with greater modesty. All that's a roundabout way of saying that there are bits of our bodies that most people are never, ever going to see. But if they didn't do their job, there would be no next generation. The human race would disappear. (laughs) There are parts of our body that we treat with great modesty, uh, but if they don't do their job, then reproduction doesn't happen. And I think that's a really good analogy in the church. You know, people who become Christians, the next generation of Christians, how do they get here? Well, mostly it's through the quiet witness and testimony of someone at work or in their class at uni or in their neighbourhood or in their share house. Them seeing someone living out their Christian life and then hearing the good news from them and then in the end God working in them and and then believing it. And it all happens very quietly, unspectacularly 
And often we only hear about it when they, they get baptised. They stand up and give their testimony and talk about how someone, often the person baptising them actually, said, you know, this is the person who told me about Jesus and I believed. And th- this, that kind of stuff happens in the church. Um, and that's what Paul is alluding to. And we must not undervalue the unseen roles. Uh, if Abhishek doesn't do his job on the AV table, if he turns down the volume, give it a go, Abhishek, and see if people can hear. <laughs> then what's going to happen? <laughs> people in the back row are going to be rushing down there and yelling at him. But see, and, and if Dan's not doing his job in the AV table and these guys turn up an hour early to get all this ready and to help get it going then the body doesn't function so well. And if people with the gifts of encouragement don't do their job, then people lag in their faith, they don't get built up and encouraged, they are not encouraged to persevere. So that's why God has made it this way. So we must not say to somebody else, you don't belong, what you're doing is just, you know, it's just a small thing. Paul said, no, there's not a small thing. Everybody is needed in the body to take their part. Verses 25 and 26, he says, The purpose of all this is so that there may be no division in the body, that all members may have the same care for each other. So two things, that there may be no division. Of course, if, if, if we're saying to each other, look, what you're doing doesn't matter, that's going to create division, isn't it? It's pretty obvious. And the flip side of that is, that God has given every one of us a task, no matter how we are gifted, that we use our gifts to express our care for one another. We're going to go into more detail about that next week in chapter 13. And Paul talks about, this expresses itself in, uh, in verse 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. So how we express our care for one another, we see someone suffering, we get alongside them, empathise with them in their pain. We see someone rejoicing, we say, good on you, go for it, and encourage them uh, to go to the next level. Fourthly, uh, on your outline, Paul says, you are the body of Christ appointed by God in verses 27 to 30. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So here, he is speaking to the church in Corinth, right? And he says, you, you plural, every one of you is the body of Christ. I think it's important for us to get this Uh, Because you often hear people say, I don't need to go to the local church. I'm part of the universal body of Christ and I can can be a Christian at home. I don't need to go there. And uh, Paul would disagree. He would say, no. The body of Christ is, who he's speaking to here, is the local church in Corinth. And if he was writing to us, he would say, cross culture, Swanston Street, you are the body of Christ. It is us here gathering together. That is the body of Christ. You might say, well, you know, I don't feel a need to come. I have my own relationship to God. With God, I can, I can uh, you know, that's what matters. I can, I can nurture my relationship with, with God at home. Well, Paul would say, listen, it's not about you. It's not all about you. It's about Jesus and his body and building up his body. And you cannot do that on your own. What what God has, has designed the church so we help one another to build one another up and that's why we all need to take our place. Finally, uh, in, verses, uh, 28, in verse 28, Paul gives a list here of some of the gifts and he puts it in a hierarchy. He tells us this by the first of all this, second that, then, 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 then. So this is a list uh, that's put in an order deliberately. And uh, there's a problem right there, isn't it? Some people say, well, uh, that's, that's valuing one over another. Let's go into this a bit. There's a little bit of controversy in this verse. Uh, one of them's right up, first up in the, the first one. Uh, God has appointed in the church first apostles. I know you're going to ask this question on the SMS, so I'm going to deal with it now. Are there apostles today? Are there apostles today? There are certainly people who claim they're apostles. And there are other people who claim they have the apostolic anointing. To unravel this question, we need to look at how the word apostle is used in the New Testament. It's used in a number of ways. At its root, it means sent out. Sent out. And 
in that sense, every Christian is an apostle. We are sent out by God to take the good news to others, the Great Commission. But of course, it's used in a more technical way in the Gospels. It refers to the 12, Jesus' 12 disciples who he appointed apostles, we're told. So they were people who were with Jesus, who heard what he said, who witnessed his death and resurrection, and at least 11 of them did, and, uh, <clears throat> and who then were, became the custodian, along with some others, the Apostle Paul was one of them, the custodians, the authorised custodians of the message of Jesus. Uh, so you'll notice in Acts 2, in the early church, that the early Christians, they devoted themselves to four things, and one of them was the apostles' teaching. So the apostles were there teaching them uh, this body of knowledge, the truth of the good news of Jesus, the message of the good news of Jesus. So before the New Testament was written, they were the recognised custodians of that and, that it, and, and their job is to make sure that it remained clear, was clearly communicated, that it wasn't distorted or added to. And uh, that was a really important thing in the early church. If you read the next letter that Paul, uh, uh, of Paul to the Corinthians, it's in our New Testament, uh, there he's dealing with an issue where people have come into the church who are claiming they were apostles. More than that, actually, they're claiming they're super apostles. And the real apostles were just sort of mediocre apostles. And, and Paul takes them on full frontally. He says, no. And he says to the Corinthians, don't listen to these people. So this was a live issue then uh, as it is now. When the apostles wrote down that body of truth and some others did it on their behalf, uh, we then had the written version of the faith once delivered for, to the saints as it's referred to. And the next generation was charged with guarding that deposit and proclaiming it and passing it on. So 1 Corinthians is written about 54 AD. When we get to Paul writing to Timothy, who's a next generation leader, right, in uh, about 66 AD, something like that, about 12 years after he's writing Corinthians, the stuff he says to Timothy, the next generation, doesn't say, Timothy, you need to write the next chapter of the New Testament. He says, Timothy, guard the good deposit, preach the word, give yourself to the public reading of scripture, do the work of an evangelist. So the task of the generations that followed, as is our task here, is to guard that good deposit and make sure it's communicated clearly, make sure we don't distort it, we don't try to add to it, that we don't superimpose our authority over it, we sit under it and let it minister to us and change us. That's our role. It's not our role to add to it. Now, the reason I'm spending a bit of time on this is because it is really important to get this straight for what we do when we come together. When you come to church or go to a life group or to go to some other Christian meeting, the purpose of it is not to get the latest word from whoever's out the front and, and, and hang on that. The purpose of all of what we're doing here today is to gather around the word of God, sit under it, understand what... That this apostolic body of knowledge means and to help one another to put it into practice and be transformed by it. So you get that? I hope you're not here this morning trying to get the latest word from Sam. My aim this morning is that you understand the last word from God that he wrote in this New Testament. I think it's really important for us to get this. When you get to the end of the New Testament, there are very dire warnings in the end of the book of Revelation, for people who add to this body of knowledge, uh, this apostolic message, or who distort it, or to, who take away from it. So, I hope that's helpful. By the way, this is why, uh, in this church, we encourage you in your life groups to study the passage that we're preaching on today in the week before. Because we want you to grapple with that passage yourselves uh, under the Holy Spirit, under the authority of God and understand it. We don't want you sitting around those groups and say, well, you know, Lou said last Sunday or Abe said and Sam said and just recycle what we've said because that indicates that you're hanging off what we say rather than what God says. <laughs> and so that's why we, we want to do it that way uh, so that we all sit under the word of God together. Right, rant over. Um, <laughs> verse uh, 29 I think it's 29, Paul and, and 30, sorry, Paul asks 
Seven questions uh, like this. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Now the reason Paul is asking these questions is because there were people in the church in Corinth who were saying there are some gifts that if you manifest these gifts, we know for sure that you're super spiritual. And Paul has already established, we know you're super spiritual because of Jesus and because of the work of the Holy Spirit in you, including you in Christ. And so Paul is refuting that idea. And he's, so he's saying, Corinthians, look around you. Is everybody an apostle, a teacher, a prophet, a miracle worker? The answer is no. And, it, and it's very clear, actually, from the way it's written in Greek. In, in Greek, they can construct a, a sentence that, that tells you whether it's anticipating a yes or a no answer. We do this bit the same in English. If I say to you, uh, are you, if you say to me, by the way, are you really Christopher Reeve's son? Now, that's a question that's expecting a no answer, isn't it? The person's not believing that. And they would be right. I would give the no answer because I, he's nothing to do with me. He's just Superman. Um, <coughs> so Paul is saying the answer to these questions is obviously no. Not everyone has these gifts, nor should we expect that they will, nor should we make a judgment that they are more spiritual because they have any one of those. They are gifts that are gifts of grace that God gives. There are many gifts and one body. I might summarise what I've been saying with this. Uh, in the words of this bloke, Jack McGorman, there is no one member church and no every member gifts. There is no one member church. In other words, when you're sitting at home reading your Bible and praying, you're not the church. You are sitting at home reading the Bible and praying by yourself. And we're the church when we gather and when we minister to one another. And when two or three are gathered and we cry out to our Lord and he grants our requests and all of those things. No one member church and no every member gifts. God does not give the same gift to everybody and we should not expect that or even try to push that idea finally in verse 31 Paul says there's a most excellent way and I've added a most excellent reason uh, for all of this we're going to look at that next week but he basically says love trumps everything no matter what gift you've got and he's already said that isn't he that the members might care for one another show their care for one another so let's do it Let me encourage you, if you're new to Cross Culture or you're a new Christian, let me encourage you to get into a life group if you're not in one already and try out your gifting. Say to the people in the life group, how can I help? How can I help in this group? And and they'll say to you, well, what are you you good at? What What have you done before? How's God used you in the past? And say to them, look, help me. I want to use my gifts better. Uh, I want to contribute to the building up of the body of Christ in this group, in our church. Please help me. Please give me feedback. You know, if I make a mess of it, tell me. Um, so that's the first thing. Do your part in building up the body. Don't ever think that your gift or anyone else's is not needed. Don't ever think that your gift or anyone else's is not needed in building up the body. Thirdly, let's encourage one another Uh, by using our gifts to build one another up. Uh, When we see somebody doing their God-appointed part in building up the body, let's encourage them, affirm them and say, hey, you did a great job of that. You know, why don't you push further in that area? And that is so helpful, isn't it, to a person? Uh, The harder thing to do is say, you know, "Mm, you're sure you're good at that? Maybe you should try something else. Uh, But let's, you know, help one another Uh, to use our gifts to build up the body of Christ. Finally, I want to challenge you today to do something. If the purpose of all this is that there might be no division in the church and that all the members might show their care for one another, let's be intentional about this today. I'm going to challenge you, before you leave here today, either over lunch or chatting to somebody afterwards, see if you can get alongside someone, maybe you know, who's had a rough time and they're suffering, and, and what Paul says here is if they're suffering, we're all suffering. Let's get alongside them and show our care for them. 
Uh, there's other people here who I'm sure have had a big win this week. They're feeling really great. And we need to rejoice with them. Say, yeah, great job. You know, that's terrific. You, got, you finally got your PhD in, you know, whatever. Let's, let's um, get alongside them and rejoice with them. I love those bits at the end of a great sporting victory uh, where everyone involved celebrates. Here's a picture of uh, a Formula One team just celebrating. They've won. Jensen Button, I think it is. And uh, <clears throat> everybody from the guy who puts the jack under the car to jack it up so the people can change the tyres and the team out the back, and who's, everybody gets out there and just, yep, we won. <laughs> we won. And I reckon this is what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back. And, and Jesus comes to receive his body that we've all been working hard on building up and helping one another to become Christ-like. And we finally get there and we've persevered in trusting Jesus. We've persevered in helping one another. And Jesus comes and gets us. And what a day that's going to be. We're going to be doing it for eternity. Yes, thank you, Jesus. We won. Yeah, that person who was tempted to give up on their faith and we got alongside them, got around them and helped them. And they got there. They got over the line. That's going to be so wonderful, isn't it? And it doesn't last just a day or two or until the next race when you lose or whatever. It, this is going to last for the whole of eternity. So, message today, let's all do our bit in the body of Christ and contribute to the building up of one another. Uh, I'm going to um, give us some time now to reflect on that and to respond uh, in our own way uh, to what God has said in this part of his word uh, Maybe you've been thinking, I've been feeling I don't fit and it feels like, it sounds like I'm holding up the work of God and I need to get more involved. Or they might, You might feel bad that you've told somebody else, look, you don't really matter and you might want to say to God you're sorry for that. You might want to say to the other person you're sorry for that as well. Why don't we take time to reflect and respond to God and then I'll lead us in prayer. Again, Jesus, we thank you so much for your promise that you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we thank you that you are working relentlessly uh, to make us more and more like yourself. We thank you that you have gifted every believer to take part in that. Thank you for the privilege of that. Lord, please help us to, to take our part Empowered by your spirit to help one another to become more and more like Jesus. No matter what part we play in the body, Father, please help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we pray it for your glory alone. Amen.